All right, well, this evening we're going to be looking at uh, the faith chapter, at least reading a portion of it to get an idea of what it is that uh, we need in order for the things we saw last week uh, to become more real and uh, more motivational to us so that we might reach out to others with, um, with the gospel. Again, how are these things that the Bible tells us about, how are they going to become uh, powerful enough, real enough in our lives to draw us out to do what our Lord calls us to do? Well, we need, uh, we need faith. So let's, um, let's read Hebrews chapter 11. I'd like to um, read the first 16 verses, and that should give us... Um, a good taste, actually the whole chapter is about this, but um, I think the first section will give us what we need to hear. Beginning in verse one, the author to the Hebrews um, writes this. Now faith is the assurance of things hoped for, the conviction of things not seen. For by it, the men of old gained approval by faith we understand that the worlds were prepared by the word of God so that what is seen was not made out of things which are visible. By faith Abel offered to God a better sacrifice than Cain through which he obtained the testimony that he was righteous. God testifying about his gifts and through faith though he is dead he still speaks. By faith Enoch was taken up so that he would not see death and he was not found because God took him up. For he obtained the witness that before his being taken up he was pleasing to God. And without faith it is impossible to please him for he who comes to God must believe that he is and that he is a rewarder of those who seek him. By faith, Noah, being warned by God about things not yet seen, in reverence, prepared an ark for the salvation of his household, by which he condemned the world and became an heir of the righteousness which is according to faith. By faith, Abraham, when he was called, obeyed by going out to a place which he was to receive for an inheritance, and he went out not knowing where he was going. By faith, he lived as an alien in the land of promise, as in a foreign land, living in tents with Isaac and Jacob, fellow heirs of the same promise. For he was looking for the city which has foundations, whose architect and builder is God. By faith, even Sarah herself received ability to conceive even beyond the proper time of life, since she considered him faithful who had promised. Therefore there was born even of one man, and him as good as dead as, at that, as many descendants as the stars of heaven in number, and innumerable as the sand which is by the seashore. All these died in faith without receiving the promises, but having seen them and having welcomed them from a distance, and having confessed that they were strangers and exiles on the earth, for those who say such things make it clear that they are seeking a country of their own. And indeed, if they had been thinking of that country from which they went out, they would have had opportunity to return. But as it is, they desire a better country that is a heavenly one. Therefore, God is not ashamed to be called their God, for he has prepared a city for them. I think you can see how appropriate uh, this this chapter and, and these examples that uh, uh, the author to the Hebrews gives would be for his audience as, um, you know, why should they put up with all this persecution? Why should they be willing to undergo what it is that they need to undergo in order to continue to confess the Lord Jesus Christ and be persecuted by the Romans? What, what's in it for them? Well, same thing that was in, in it for those in this chapter who endured these, these difficulties in order to obtain God's promises. As a matter of fact, the author of the Hebrews said that all of these actually saw the Messiah and they died in faith without having received it or having seen it, but, but they did see it by faith and they welcomed it even though it was far away, they welcomed it as though it was a certainty because they believed God. Uh, faith, as we're going to see, is, is essential uh, for these motives that we've looked at 
uh, to actually impact our lives, to actually change the way that we live. Now let me just remind you, uh, last week we were thinking about some of the things that we might use to motivate ourselves to share the gospel with others. Uh, it's something that we know that we need to do. It's something that if we are believers, we already know basically uh, how to do it, at least what the content of the message is, how to reach out to other people in the same way people did with us, just simply um, share the gospel with them, tell them about Jesus Christ, S simple message. But it's one thing, again, to know the Lord calls us to do this and to know, again, the message and how to do it, but it's still another thing actually to do it. Uh, usually the only thing that stands between us, what we know we should do, and what it is that we actually do, as we saw last week, is motivation. Uh, do we really want to do this? Do we have the desire to do it? Uh, if we don't want to do something, we generally won't do it. If we want to do one thing more than another, we'll do that thing we want to do more than the other. But of course, if we really want to do something, uh, it's really hard to stop ourselves from doing it. Sometimes we want to do things we shouldn't, and it's hard to keep ourselves from doing that. But when we want to do something that we really should, we'll have that same, not difficulty, but basically that same advantage. We need to want to do what it is the Lord calls us to do. So again, what are some of the things the Lord has given to us to motivate us to evangelize? Well, thinking that perhaps we've already, it's already slipped out of our minds what we were looking at last week. I thought I would just briefly review the, the seven things that we looked at, but again, very briefly. Uh, the main reason that we exist is for this purpose. This is why God made us. This is why the Lord redeemed us. This is why we're here. Uh, so basically, this is the answer to the question, why am I here? It's because God made me and he redeemed me so that I might share his gospel with others, that I might advance his kingdom. Uh, this clearly is the task that our Lord gave to his church in the Great Commission. It, it is our duty. What it is we are to be doing in this world for his glory while we're here. Remember Spurgeon said, this is something that if we are to glorify God, we must agree with him on. We must agree with him that this is our task, our purpose. Uh, by the way, I should mention that this is something that we can only do here. Uh, and when our time is up, our task is going to be over. We're going to rest from this work forever. So basically, this is why we're here and this is going to be our only opportunity to do it. Now, if this is what the Lord wants us to do and we don't do it, uh, we do know that there is such a thing as discipline. God's fatherly chastening. He chastens us the way we chasten our own children to get them to do what is right. And so we're encouraged by the author to the Hebrews, actually in the next chapter, that if we do find difficulty doing this and, and if we do experience the Lord's chastening, first of all, we should be thankful that he is disciplining us. But secondly, we do need to get back on track. And we do need to realize that when the Lord does discipline us, it's because he loves us. It's for our good. And I think we'd all agree getting back on track and doing what he calls us to do is good. Uh, we should do this because the Lord has promised that he would be with us. He has promised that he will give us success. Remember, we saw that he's the good shepherd who goes before his flock and he will, as he said in the Great Commission, be with us to the very end of our lives. So he will bless this. He will bless us. He will give us grace to be able to do what he's called us to do. He hasn't left us to do it on our own. Uh, the Lord has promised the blessing, I, I think clearly in Scripture, that if we will do this, that we will see the Lord at work in a way that we wouldn't otherwise see him. I think we will see greater and more immediate answers to prayer because we're agreeing with God, because we are doing what he has called us to do, because we are doing what he has made us to do. Basically, if we're willing to give ourselves to this greatest of all works, he will help us more if we will simply yield to him more. Clearly, the Lord has also promised us greater rewards in heaven 
And those are the rewards he, that our Lord Jesus tells us that we should be storing up, not treasures on earth, but treasures in heaven where you know, the things that we store up don't corrupt, they don't dissolve like the things on earth, and nobody can take them away. We'll actually be able to enjoy them forever. This is the ultimate retirement program. This is what we ought to be investing in, uh, the kingdom of heaven. And of course, when we consider how great God's love is and the love that he has shown toward us in sending his son to give his life for us, to save us from the hell that we deserved while we were still his enemies, how can we not show our thankfulness to him in doing what he has called us to do? And then finally, when we consider what's going to happen to those who are around us, our family, our friends, our neighbors, if they should die in their sins, how they will suffer in pain and anguish forever when they might have been spared through the gospel, again, how can we not tell them? Now, ultimately, the purpose behind all of this is to motivate us, to help us to see what it is that, that the Lord has promised, why we're here, what, what's at work, why it is we need to reach out with the gospel, why we need to agree with him and get involved more in this work than perhaps we have up to this point for all of these reasons. But tonight I want us to consider one other thing that we need. If any of the things that I've just mentioned last week and just reviewed for you this evening are going to do us any good, and that is faith. We need to believe that these things are true. Now, if we're Christians here this evening, if we're believers, then at some level we, we do believe these things. Obviously, if we didn't, we would have never trusted in the Lord Jesus Christ. We would never be, well, we wouldn't come here and worship him if we didn't believe he existed, if there wasn't a God that we're actually worshiping. Um, and certainly, we wouldn't be doing the things that we're already doing for his glory. But we're going to do these things, of course, to the degree that we believe them. In other words, the stronger our faith, the more we will give ourselves uh, to these things. We need conviction. We need certainty that these things are true. To the degree that we have it, to that degree we'll be motivated, but to the degree that we don't, to that degree our desire to do this work will be weakened, particularly because there is a cost that is involved. It's uncomfortable. People might get upset. We might lose friends. People might hate us, might say nasty things about us. Some people might do things even worse than that. As a matter of fact, Christians were put to death for doing this. The author to the Hebrews was addressing a people who were going to lose everything they had and perhaps even their own lives to profess faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. They had to be certain that they were doing it and you know, doing it for the right reasons, doing it because it's real and not just because it's something they hope is real. You're not going to be willing to pay this price unless you are convinced that these things are true. And that is really what faith is all about. That's why the Lord gave us faith in the first place, so that we could see the reality of these things, so that it would strengthen our conviction, so that it would increase our desire, so that we would move forward, that we would do... Um, what Jesus said that people were doing when John the Baptist came on the scene and he began to preach. They saw the kingdom of heaven through his preaching. And realizing that it was real, they did everything they could to enter into that kingdom. They were willing to pay any price that was necessary. That's why the Lord's given us faith. The author to the Hebrews writes in verse 1, which is really a summary of everything that follows. Now faith is the assurance of things hoped for, the conviction of things not seen. I mean, who needs faith if these things are in front of you, if you can see them? You need faith for the things you can't see. You have to be able to trust that what God says is true. We need faith. We need a strong faith. Now that's something that God's people have always needed. We may tend to think that living for God was actually a relatively easy thing for those people who lived during biblical times. 
they seemed to be able to live in, in full view of the reality. It seemed as though they could see it, and that's why they believed it. In other words, for them, seeing was believing. And sometimes that was true. I mean, sometimes they had advantages that we do not have. I mean, for instance, when God appeared to Adam and Eve in the garden, was there any question in their mind that God existed when they're standing there right in front of him? I don't think they had that particular struggle. When Jesus revealed himself to his disciples and they saw the miracles that he was doing, it seemed that there was no reason left to doubt this is him. On the other hand, we do have to recognize there were many cases where even seeing wasn't enough. There were people who saw God and who saw Jesus Christ who still didn't believe, still didn't love him, still didn't follow him. Do you realize that Cain had conversation with God? And yet, what did Cain do? He hated God. He hated his brother. He killed his brother. And he came under a curse. And yet, he was a man who actually talked with God. A Judas, what is it that Judas didn't experience that all the rest of the disciples did? He was with them. He saw Jesus. He saw his miracles. He even performed miracles along with the rest of them. And yet, he actually betrayed Jesus Christ. Many of the religious leaders in Israel saw the miracles of the Lord Jesus Christ, but when they saw them, they didn't say, ah, the Messiah, let's worship him. They just viewed these miracles as really nothing more than obstacles they had to overcome so that they could put him to death. So this is just simply to say that seeing is not always believing. Even if we could live with these things in front of our eyes, at all times and could see them with our own eyes as it were, it wouldn't be enough. We need something more. Now again, what we need is faith. Think about the many who didn't see and yet believed. And again, maybe they talked with God, but they didn't necessarily see what it is that God was telling them about. They had to exercise faith. Uh, God, for instance, in the text we just read, warned Noah about something he had never seen and something that he wouldn't see for another hundred years. A hundred years? I mean, most of us don't live to be a hundred years old. Obviously, they lived longer in those days, but he had to wait a hundred years to see what it is that God was actually warning him about. But even though he didn't see it, he believed God. He built the ark and he and his household were saved because he had faith. Faith gave substance, gave reality to the warning that God had given him. Uh, God promised to Abraham, as we've just read, that he would give him and his children a land, the land of Canaan. And on the basis of that promise, Abraham left his relatives he left his home, he left his property, he left everything he was familiar with and he went out to receive that land even though he had no idea where he was going. He just simply believed that what God said was true and he acted upon it. Faith gave substance to what God said and reality. And he went and he received it, although in essence he didn't actually possess the land. He did possess it. His children possessed it as God had promised that he would. God had promised to Abraham that he would multiply his children and make them as, as many as the stars in the heavens. And back in those days, they didn't have all these lights, you know, and they could see how many stars were out there and there was more than anyone could count. He said, as numerous as the sand which is on the seashore. And God made that promise to Abraham when he was already advanced in years and he had no children and Sarah was barren. And even though Abraham had to wait until he was 100 years old, 100 and Sarah at that time was 90, Scripture says that Abraham never wavered in his belief that God would do exactly what he said he would do. And because he believed God, God fulfilled that promise exactly as he said. You know also that after that child was finally born and after he had become a young man, God told Abraham on one occasion to take that son of promise and offer him as a burnt offering on one of the mountains in the land of Moriah. And Abraham was willing even to do this. 
He bound Isaac and laid him on the wood. He raised his knife and would have killed him if the Lord had not stopped him. Now that's interesting because Abraham knew that Isaac was the answer to his prayers. Lord, give me an heir. Isaac was that heir. Isaac was the fulfillment of God's promise that I will bless you. I will give you an heir. I will give you this seed. And he also knew that God was intending to fulfill his promise to multiply his children in that vast number that he had promised through Isaac. God's command to offer Isaac on that altar as a burnt offering, basically to kill him and then to burn his body into ashes, was against everything that God had promised to Abraham, but Abraham was still willing to carry it out because he knew that God was faithful. That, again, is because Abraham believed God, because he had faith in God, because that faith gave reality and conviction that what God said was true. Now, there were those in Scripture who seem never to have heard God's voice audibly, and yet, because they had heard him speaking in his word, which is basically our situation today, and knew what he wanted them to do, were willing to pay the ultimate price in obeying him. Now, one example in the Old Testament that occurred to me was that of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, who were threatened with being burned alive. I mean, basically thrown into a furnace where they would roast into ashes if they did not bow down and worship Nebuchadnezzar's statue. Now, you know, because of what God said, they refused to obey the king even though they didn't have a specific promise from God that he was necessarily going to save them from that furnace, they still obeyed him. They said, hey, you know, God may deliver us, God may not deliver us, but one thing we're not going to do is bow down to the statue. We were going to honor God. But you know what? God did deliver them because they honored him. We just sang this song, you know, Faith of Our Fathers, and it reminds us of the early Christians as Greg said earlier, who were basically almost lining up to be eaten by the lions. Can you imagine what that would be like if some lion pounced on you and tore you to pieces and basically was eating you alive? And yet they were willing to do that rather than offer a pinch of incense to Caesar and call him Lord. That was the consequence for not obeying that command. And they were put to death in many horrible ways. Just read Fox's Book of Martyrs if you want to see. And yet they were willing to do that. Why? Why were they willing to do that? Why was Luther willing to face the church that, that basically all of them turned against him except for a few handful of people who believed what Luther was saying was true? And the governmental authorities of those days which branded him basically an outlaw and a heretic and anybody could have killed him on the spot, why was he willing to stand for the gospel in the face of all of that? What moved Calvin and Whitfield and Wesley and Edwards and Spurgeon and Ryle and you fill in the blank, you know, because there's a whole host of, of godly men and women who made some great sacrifices in order to serve the Lord? What, what made them willing to do that when they could have used the gifts that they had to enjoy a very comfortable living and perhaps make a name for themselves in this world? There's people who look back at at Edwards, for instance, and they said, if this guy had just become a philosopher, he would have been one of the greatest philosophers. If he had become a mathematician, he'd be one of the greatest mathematicians. He could have made a name for himself in this world. Why was he willing to give all that up in order to serve God? Well, for one thing, he knew that whatever he gained in this world would eventually be forgotten and lost, but whatever he did for God would be remembered. And the reason why all of these did this was because they had faith they didn't have a weak faith. They had a strong faith. And because they had a strong faith, they could see what God had promised. They could see what was ahead more clearly. The glory that God had laid up for them in heaven. And of course, that's, it's because that's what they wanted. They wanted what God had to offer. Because they had a strong faith, they felt the call of God on their lives more keenly. They had the assurance that the Lord Jesus Christ was with them more powerfully. They could see heaven and hell 
opened before them, and they wanted, by God's grace, not only to arrive in heaven themselves, but they wanted to bring as many people as they could with them to heaven and spare as many as they could from falling into the pit. You see, faith is what gave substance to the promises of God. You've got to realize it. We all need to realize what God says in his word is real and it's true apart from whether or not we believe it, but it's only going to impact us to the degree that we actually believe what it is that God said. Now, faith is what kept them from getting caught up in the things of the world. It kept them from being crippled by this world and it moved them to push forward to what was ahead. You know, without any uh, collusion on our part, uh, as Greg was uh, reading a devotional that was put together from the, the Puritans, it just so happens that Thomas Manton and the portion he was reading this week happened to be land, landed exactly on this text. And um, I'm not sure that, that Greg knew, and it obviously wouldn't have mattered because he was reading the portion that was for this particular day. But Manton summarizes this point in one of his sermons uh, in his, his work on Hebrews 11. So let me read for you um, a little bit of an extended quote and let it be an encouragement. This is what he says. Hopefully I can read it so that we can understand everything he says. We should have such a faith to substantiate our hopes and to check sensuality. For we find the corrupt heart of man is all for present satisfaction. Though the pleasures of sin be short and inconsiderable, yet, because they are near at hand, they have more influence than the joys of heaven, which are future and absent. We wonder at the folly of Esau to sell his birthright for a morsel of meat. When lust is up and eager for, for, for fulfillment, all considerations of eternal glory and blessedness are laid aside to give it satisfaction. Now, if you understand what he's saying here, I mean, haven't you experienced this in your own life? What's close to you is more tempting than what is far away. It has more influence on you. That's basically what he's saying. Now, he goes on, a little pleasure, a little gain, a little happiness in the world will make men part with all that is honest and sacred. A man would wonder at their folly but the great reason is they live by sense. Demas, in love with the present world, has deserted me. A quote from Paul. Here lies the bait. These things are present. We can taste the delights of the world and feel the pleasures of the flesh. But the happiness of the world to come is a thing unseen and unknown. Let us eat and drink. For tomorrow we die. This is the language of every carnal heart. Present advantages and vanities, though they are small and but trifles, have more power to pervert us than the good things at a distance and the promises of God, even to allure and draw in our hearts to God. So these things have more power over us than the promises of God. Here lies the root and strength of all temptations. The inconveniences of strictness in religion are present and they may have present distaste and present trouble to the flesh and our rewards are yet future. This is our problem, again, as he says, and the strength of the temptation because, well, serving God is difficult. The, the rewards are at a distance, but the things that satisfy, well, satisfy the flesh are right here and you can get them right now. So, how can we check this living by sense that is so natural to us? Why faith? Substantiating our hopes provides a remedy. Faith makes things to become as real as if they were already enjoyed. Where faith is alive and strong and is the conviction of things not seen, it baffles and defeats all temptations. Faith is what we need. Faith takes those things at a distance and brings them near. It allows us to enjoy them as if we already possess them. That's the reason why all these did what we just saw that they did. By the way, Edwards pointed out that this is the reason unbelievers also put off coming to the Lord Jesus Christ and they aren't 
as alarmed as they should be about the hell they're in danger of because that seems like it's a long ways off, but the things that they really enjoy are close at hand. And things that are far off don't seem quite as threatening as things, you know, when they're near. I mean, you know, the, the edge of a cliff isn't so daunting if you happen to be 100 miles away from it, but if you're standing on the edge, well, that's something altogether different. But the fact is, faith tells us that that edge is coming, and they need faith to be able to see it as well. Now, again, the same thing can be true with us. Heaven may seem like it's a long way off, and so it doesn't seem to move us the way that it should. Hell seems like it's a long way off for the unbeliever, and so it doesn't seem to move us to reach out to the unbeliever as we should. What we need is a faith that brings these things near, that shows us how things really are and how short a time it really is before all of these things are basically going to be over for those in danger and for us and also how short a time it will be before our opportunity to help people is basically going to be gone. So faith is key. Now, this basically is an introduction, isn't it? Because we, we don't have time to, to go through all the different ways that we might possibly strengthen our faith or the ways in which the Lord actually will make sure that our faith grows. But I don't want to leave us entirely hanging. How can we strengthen our faith? Well, we want to consider that the next time, perhaps in a few more sermons. But let's consider at least this at the end. Remember that God's spirit is the author of faith. It's his office, it's his work. He's the one that initiates it, he's the one that creates it, and he is the one who strengthens it. Uh, he is the one who basically takes what God has told us in his word and shows us just how real these things really are. The more we have of the spirit of God, the more real these things will be because the stronger our faith will be and of course the less we have of him the less real they will seem and so whatever we can do to strengthen his work in our souls will at the same time strengthen our faith and our ability to see as near what now may seem to us as something far away now two things we can do to strengthen his influence are these and, and I'll just encourage you to engage more in these things because I think the more we do it the stronger we'll become read the word faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of Christ Romans 10 17 now the gospel that's how the Spirit of God works to to begin faith to initiate faith but it's also how he feeds faith as we read the Word of God, He strengthens us in faith to believe what it is we're reading. By the way, our flesh is going to work overtime to push out of our minds everything we know about the Word of God and basically put them out of view. We need to keep these things in front of us. Just as the Spirit of God uses the Gospel to convert and He doesn't do it out of the blue, so He's not going to strengthen your faith simply out of the blue unless you're in the Word. But the second thing you can do is pray and ask that the Lord would strengthen your faith and be ready <laughs> be ready for what the Lord is going to bring in order to bring that about and we'll look at more of those things uh, next time but the more we do these things the stronger our faith is going to be so let's recommit ourselves to seek the Lord in this way that we might day by day grow in faith so that the things the Lord tells us in his word are real will really influence our lives as they should. Well, let, let's bow for a moment of silent prayer and let's ask the Lord to help us do that.